record on this machine and we will start with uh, just a brief summary of the course. So we are getting towards the uh, second last week uh, of the course. We Everyone should have uh, Oblique 1 done already. So if you if you haven't done by this week, you should have talked with Eilert. And I think everyone is sorted. He didn't told me anything about it, so should be fine. So this one is ticked. And then for Oblique 2, he informed me that, of course, he will have end of semester problems uh, with his own assignments and with his own uh, reports. So please do this as soon as possible. Uh, you don't, it doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be completely finished. You can always do a little bit extra later. So please, uh, please do it as soon as possible. So try to arrange a meeting with Eiler, then, then just go ahead and, and do that. This way you will have a tick, then he will be free a little bit earlier for focusing on his own, um, his own assignments. All right, so then assignment one, I think I am really happy with some of your work and I think the peer review also went pretty well. I will give feedback later on. So I will um, probably not this week, but maybe next week or the week after, because we, I can give you feedback after the course. It's not a, a, a like I don't have a deadline on 28th of uh, April. So there will be a session either remote or physical that we will discuss the actual feedback of both assignments and we will have a discussion on it. I am, I am still waiting for a student to check if we will have the review of the review. I am not 100% sure, but he should do it. So then as we were discussing on Discord, it will be a short session and then you will have a couple of questions related to the quality of the review that you got from other students. So that's what it is all about. It should be very easy to do and very quick. So not no extra work. Uh, hi, Cecilia. Good morning. I have uh, notes here. All right. So then this will possibly come. I will let you know and then I will advertise it. It's not uh, it's not tested yet. So that that feature is a work in progress. All right. Related to assignment two, we had quite a good discussions uh, in Discord, and I will come back to that after the main lecture. So in, in the main lecture, we uh, will do a couple of things, and then after, I will talk about assignment two. So in the main lecture, what we want to talk about is first, uh, we will talk about word count. We've done word count before, um, and I think you are pretty familiar with word count. So if I, for example, like, so I will do a little bit of light coding because it's easier for explaining what is happening. So what I will do is I will generate um, stack new workout, word count. Yes, we can do that. Well, let's, because I already have this folder. So let's call it WC. Okay, so if I go to WC, and WC is already an existing uh, command in Unix systems, so it is used for counting uh, lines, words, and characters. So if I feed to it what is generated for libc, uh, lib.hs, it will tell me we have six lines, 14 words, and 88 characters, and if I um, if I display it, then it is what it is. So it's like one, two, three, four, five, six lines, correct. And then 14 words, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 14. Yeah, I don't know how the words are counted because this will be a single word, but this will be a single word. Ah, oh, yeah, this will be a single word. And this will be a single word. So it's like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. So it's correct as well. So fourteen words and so on. So 
that is what word count is doing and we will implement our own very quickly so i will open code yes i trust you okay so how we would we do um word count in haskell you can code along, so please open your own stack project and try to do it. Or if you want, you can try to do it in, in uh, Rust as well. So let's do it very quickly here. So I will rename my func to word count. Okay, I will say my word count. Okay, so what will word count take? I could have it such that it will take a string. And then what we need is we need three things. We need the number of lines, number of words, and number of characters, right? And then we have to implement it. So uh, word count will take some text. And then we need to return this triplet. So we need to return number of lines, number of words, and number of characters. And then we need to get them. So how are we going to get them? Well, it's pretty straightforward in, in Haskell, correct? So if we have the whole text and we want to get the number of characters and the text is a string and string is a list of characters, then we say, well, you know, number of characters is effectively a length of my text. Great, so we have number of characters. How about number of words? Well, yes, same story. We will get the length of the words from our text. So words tokenizes all the text, separates the white space from the word tokens, gives us a list, and then we count the, we count the length of it. And then the final one is lines number of lines and it's effectively the same thing right so that was pretty painless okay great so we have our implementation for word count in haskell it took like you know no time at all um how long it would take you in rust okay try uh do it in rust is this implementation a good one well we're gonna see in a moment so well, how are we going to use it? Well, in the main, we have to, okay, so in the lib, we have to say WC is exported. It is. In the main, we have to say that we're going to call it. But we could do this. We could say do. And then we need to get the text from get contents. And then we would have to get the... So let number of lines, number of words, number of characters equal WC from text. And then we would print or put string line. And then we would print, pretty print the results. So let's do that. Uh, number of lines first. So we will say show number of lines concatenated with some spacing so we will do tab concatenated with show number of words concatenated with some spacing and then the final thing is show number of cars perfect so then we have our implementation and we have our implementation and then we go back here and we say Tag build to check if there are any problems. No problems. So then we will say WC of source lib to just have a baseline. So the baseline is 10 lines, 36 words, 218 characters. And then we will do the same for our implementation. So stack run dash dash. And voila it reports exactly the same data. So our implementation is consist consistent with the Linux one. And then oh, oh, bash, 
uh, and then it, it, it works. So is it a good implementation? So looking at the code, we see that it's it looks not bad. Um, we're using a string and we've heard, yeah, we should not really use a uh, string in production. Okay, Cecilia is saying. Yeah, so number of cars is counting the is counting the white space too. So the length of the so our implementation here will count all the white spaces too. So the the number of characters is correct. It's all the characters, including the white space. Number of words, of course, doesn't count the word the white space. It only counts the words, right? So like um, if I have if I have uh, text, so if I have mama mama then it's two words and if i enter more space here and here it still is two words right so the space doesn't matter for number of words okay so then when we look at the implementation we say well it, it looks kind of tidy it, it looks okay uh this one is a little bit untidy because we kind of have a long main right oh yes we have three lines but it's a little bit not modular, right? We don't like mains to be quite complex. And we're doing a little bit of logic here. We're basically getting the, you know, the standard input content into the text and so on. So what we probably should do, we should probably refactor it. So let's call this function world, uh, word count um, pure. So I will say P. And then because it takes the uh, pure string and returns the pure triplet. And let's have another function in the in the in this module, which we will call word count. And the word count will be an IO function, and it will basically do that. And then in our main, because there is nothing else to do, we will basically say word count, right? So this way I have a word count function which does all this logic and then calls this uh, pure function for me and then returns the, returns the result and it kind of does that here. Um, you could handle the, uh, the printout from this function. So you could call, um, you could return instead of making it an IO action, you could make it IO action of three things and then print here, but it would be still messy. So I, I think that that one is quite nice. So then you could probably add some comments, right? So count lines, words, and characters from standard input. Okay. Should I be commenting here? Yes, I probably should comment here as well. Okay, so let's... Save this and let's rerun it again just to make sure that we didn't broke anything. Yes, we did. We broke the export because we are exporting P now. Perfect. So let's do that. Uh, yes, and we need to be nice to the type system and we need to say that main Right, so main is a function, which is an IO action. All right, so then it's nice. Code-wise, it looks nice. Uh, it works. Okay, so how can we assess? All right, there is a question. Let me see. Alexander, forgetting the words from a string, at least we can use speed white space. Collect, yes, in Rust. Of course, you can do that. So that's nice. Rust is not... That terrible. Uh, and then just to clarify, okay, so Ferdinand is asking the logistic question uh, about assignments. So I will put a note here. So uh, both assignments can be in the same language. Okay, no problem. We, we originally thought each assignment needs to be in a different language, but if people want to specialize in a single language, for example, you love Rust, you want to do everything in Rust, or you really got into Haskell and you want to master the Haskell type system and do one more assignment with Haskell, go ahead. So no problem. Uh, both assignments can be in the same language. It's up to you. Okay, so 
what else can we assess about the quality of this code? Well, we can kind of time it. We can say how fast it works. And if we have a Rust implementation, we can say how fast the Rust implementation works. So what we can do is we can use a time and work count and then source, source, what is that called? Source slash lib edge hs. So I'm timing how long it takes to execute a original binary word count, right? And it takes, so the entire, the entire from including loading and everything is like almost uh, four milliseconds and it's split for the user time. And that is usually the IO like reading uh, from the files and so on. And then the processing is pretty fast. So we can see that IO is pretty much the bottleneck here. Uh, the actual computation is not that long. So as you think about the problem, like we have the, uh, the, um, the stream, and then as, as we're reading the stream, we have to count how many characters we have and when the white space finishes and so on. So the, the processing, there is not much. I mean, you, you're probably doing some addition. I mean, the, the compiled version is doing some additions, but there is not much heavy calculations happening. So it, it kind of explains what, what's going on. And then we can check our, our implementation. So we can do the same for stack run dash dash. Yep, on the same program. Uh, that's not good because we spent time compiling it, you see. So I will kind of rerun it again. So this time it was not much better. Uh, so, okay, it was much better. So before it almost took two seconds. Now it took 365 milliseconds. And you can see that the IO is, uh, let's see the other, the, the original one. So the IO for Haskell took 25 milliseconds and for C it took two. And then quite a lot of time spent in processing, right? So garbage collector, uh, fancy processing of the string and so on. So we see in Haskell, we're not doing too much, too, too, I mean too good uh, compared to the native C implementation of WC. So here we already can see that um, even though the code is nice, we not doing quite well in terms of actual processing speed, right? So there is a question, just curious, what language was used to write the build in WC? I believe it was C. So I think the original WC command, which we're running is written in C. Uh, it might have been optimized. So it might have even include some assembly, but I believe it, it is the original uh, Unix WC is in, in C. So it is pretty fast. It, it is kind of like a top-notch uh, implementation. So if you do one in Rust, compare it to WC as well. All right, so then what should we do? So from now, like what do we do next? Um, well, we can re-implement. Uh, we can re-implement WC in using a little bit better data structure in Haskell. So I already told you, and you may think, oh yeah, Marius told us in the class that uh, when we do some production code, usually we should not use string. Usually we should use data text. And data text is a more native, more compact, more um, robust um, representation of, um, of textual data. And we should re-implement it using text instead. And we should do that. But before we do that, we kind of need a little bit better mechanism for calculating how long functions take. Because this one, the you know the time command which I'm using here in 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 Bash, it's it's fine. It tells you more or less what's going on, and you can see which one is faster and not. But it only it it kind of counts the execution of the command, including loading that lo booting time, and then tearing down time. So everything is calculated. So it's not really a function of our word count. It's everything, right? And then you can say, yeah, this program is so small that everything is the function that we're doing. But in many cases, that's not the case. And in many cases, we need to isolate exactly the timing of the function that we want. 
And in, and you probably have done it before. You probably would think, yeah, okay, uh, let's go here and let's be before we do anything. Uh, let's um, so start a timer, right? So here we will start the timer. Uh, here we will kind of uh, stop the timer, and here we will report how long the function took, right? So that would be like a pseudocode that we would do like in some programming languages to calculate how long this thing takes. And then if you really want to isolate, you could say, okay, I want to calculate how long that takes. And then you could put another uh, stop timer, stop intermediate timer here, and then calculate how long that line of code takes, right? Um, so to make this process easier and to make this process more repeatable and more um, nice in terms of reporting of what's going on, we will not instrument by hand this code, but we will use a framework. And we will use a framework for benchmarking, right? So we we are here, we implemented word count. Im Implemented, perfect. And then we want to do some benchmark. So benchmarking functions. So what we want is we want to calculate how long a function take such that if we re-implement it or make some modifications, we can re-benchmark it and we can see what has happened. Is our time increased or has our time decreased, right? And for that reason, we will use some benchmarking um, framework or library. Framework or library or some form of support. We don't want to write it ourselves. Per Morton would write it himself, of course, and he did. <laughs> but we are lazy and we say, yeah, we use some ready ones which are made by Per Morton or some other people. So in the context of, um, in the context of Haskell, the performance um, measurement library that is de facto a standard is called Criterion. And if you go to Hackage uh, and look for Criterion, you will get to this page. And then the latest version is 1.6.0.0, which means we kind of need to include this, um, this library for our uh, implementation. And we also need to look up how we should supposed to use it. So if I open it in the tab, it shows us, whoa, we will have some fancy graphs. That's nice. How should we use it? We kind of need to include it via Cabal, but we are not using Cabal, we're using Stack. So for Stack, what we need to do is we need to go to package YAML and we need to say, we're going to use Criterion. OK, and cri Criterion, did I spell it correctly? No, with E. Yeah, so that's what we will use for benchmarking. And we want to re-implement also with text. So I will add text here so I don't have to come back to that uh, package file. And now, yeah, let's look up how we're using it. And we have some, I will kind of skip a little bit this part. So you will do some reading on your own if you want. What I will do is I will go to, I think, to tutorial. And then we want to benchmark IO action. And if we're doing benchmark IO action, we basically say, this, right? We substitute our main with the default main from Criterion. We need to import this, and then we need to do this line. So I will be lazy, and I will kind of um, do this by copy and paste. So I will copy, I will copy that. Okay, we, we have now Criterion, we have this. Uh, we're not modifying our implementation, so we will it will be the same. And then in here, we will do what they suggest, which is which is this. All right, so 
and we are benchmarking word count and we have um we not reading a file what we doing is we doing the word count right and because we only doing word count we don't need round brackets so that works fine i will go back so let's let's do this and let's check that we are that we are good to go with this so stack build. We yeah, are perfect. So in fact, it will already work. So what I can do now, I, I can say stack run, and then I can say, um, if you look into um, how do you generate? Yeah, so you basically run it and you say what output HTML file you want, such that you can look it up later, right? So what I will say, output bench, bench HTML. And what happens now is the, the library, the framework takes our word count function and it runs it multiple times, every time counting, um, Oh yeah, so so it's actually doing nothing at the moment because it expects uh, the input from the standard input, right? So what what should happen is the program should take the function and run it multiple times to calculate the time, how long it took, then calculate an average and then show us the spread around the average such that we know precisely what is the variance and what is the expected time that this function will take. And for this, I have to do source um, libhs to pass to our function, right? So now you already, like from my description, you should wonder, will that work? Can our WC function be run multiple times to calculate how long it takes if I'm passing to it um, a standard input? What do you think? Anyone? Come on, it's easy. It's easy, but I, I didn't thought about it. <laughs> so I, I've done this, this exercise yesterday and I didn't thought about it actually. Yeah, it sounds like a leading question. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so it will break, right? It will break. Why? Why it will break? So let's let's run it. And of course, it runs the first time the benchmark library runs our function, it works. But what happens when the benchmark library tries to run our function second time? So you see what happens. We get illegal operation. So what, what has happened? Well, what has happened? Well, what has happened is the very first time we ran WC, we got the content up to the end of the stream, and then we calculated the statistics and we printed them. And that's what has happened, right? We calculated the statistics, we printed them, and then what happened? Then the benchmarking library tries to run our function second time. So it goes here, it tries to read the content for the second time, but the first time already went all the way to the end of stream. So there is no stream anymore. So the second time you try to run it, it says, well, you know, the, your stream has been closed because you reached the end of the stream. So it doesn't work. So it's like, shit, it doesn't work. Of course it doesn't work. But like, I didn't thought about it will not work. I thought it will work, but of course it cannot work. So we need to modify it. So because we need to modify it, we basically have to say, we have to make this function repeatable, right? So this function, supposed to be able to be called multiple times and it should always work right so we basically have to get rid of this get contents because the get contents is killing us right it, it, that's the source of our problem so what we will do is we will say 
input file, uh, which is a uh, file path. And then we will say input file is, um, in our case, it's source leap HS. That's what we use for testing our, our implementation. And here we will replace it with a different call to read file and input file. Yeah, let's call it info file name, such that it's very descriptive. All right, so then what, what I did change is instead of reading from standard input, I'm reading from a file and I can call this function multiple times. So then it, it, the behavior is exactly the same. It's just that, uh, so just to prove to you that the behavior is exactly the same, let's call main wc wc and let's comment this for now to rerun it such that to double check that our our implementation uh, that's wc okay so stack stack run Okay, so it complains that I'm not using criterion because I'm not using criterion, but it works fine, right? So uh, let's double check that it calculated correctly. Yes, so 10 lines, 36 words, 20, 221 characters. It's all good. Uh, and our new implementation works exactly the same. And we're using the, yeah, by the way, now when I'm, I run a WC, uh, yeah, for the original WC, I have to pass. But when I'm running stack, uh, I don't need this anymore because we're reading from a file, right? So that's that's what it is. Okay, so let's go back to our original implementation and let's try what the benchmark will tell you tell us, right? So I yeah, I will rerun it. Um, I did I save it? No. Okay, so when I rerun it, it will have to rebuild it. It will have to run it, and then it will calculate the statistics. And as you see, because we are doing the printout, um, we are doing this print line in our function. You actually see it in the standard output, right? So here you see the printouts, and you see how many times the function has been run. So you see that the function has been run for many times. And then we did have, um, yeah, I should say output bench HTML. So let's redo it. Okay, and then I can open bench HTML. Should I use a bigger function, uh, not, not a bigger function, a bigger uh, input file such that the function takes longer time? I probably should. So this this function this uh, cut this this file is very small, so it takes almost no time to do it. Like it's it's a very small amount of work, and when you per benchmarking something, doing something that is very small usually leads to uh, quite a, a big variance uh, or kind of inaccurate. Uh, prediction of how long something takes. So it's good if you could run this function on files which are uh, short and longer and even longer. Uh, and when you do that, you can include kind of a group of benchmarks here and you can um, benchmark like a short file, medium file and large file. And then the benchmarking library will use that data to, to show you kind of a more insightful information of what is happening with your size of the input growing. Uh, because it's just a demo, like I'm only, only conceptually explaining to you what's happening, we will continue using this very small file as a test, but uh, we, and, and the main reason is because it, it, it's really fast. I can show you, I have a bigger file. So I have, um, no, I will not show you, but I have a, like a hundred megabytes text file, which I used for tests. And it takes like um, 25 seconds to process it. Uh, and then the statistics obviously take much longer to collect because the benchmarking will have to run it multiple times. And then multiples of 25 seconds, you know, it ends up hours. 
uh, and then you get the statistics after a while, right? So normally you should use a bigger file, but for the sake of the brevity of the lecture, I'm using the, the small file here. So let's open the benchmark results and let's see what we got. All right, it's on the other screen. Let me quickly grab that. So let's put it here. That's not the one which we want. The one which we want is this. Brilliant. So we have our results and we see that our benchmarking library run our program eight times 10 to the third, which is, I'm not sure if that's big enough, which is 8,000 times, right? So it has run it eight times, 8,000 times, each time calculating what is the, uh, what is the result. And of course, running it 8,000 times takes eight times, 8,000 times longer. So you have kind of like a linear progression of um, of the runs. So this is like running it once. It takes, you know, sub-second. And then as you progress, it takes longer and longer because you're running it multiple times. And then the program calculates statistics and draws you this kind of a variance. How, how um, what are the, you know, the sigma around the result? And then it tells you the result. So the result is 27 microseconds, right? So we see here, um, we have an average 27.4 microseconds. And then uh, there is a uh, what was the shortest and the long longest run. And then what is the standard deviation? So a standard deviation is 800. Oh, that's the lowest. Uh, it's around 900 nanoseconds. And the function took... 27 microseconds to execute, right? Compare it to the um, 185 microseconds that we had originally calculated for running the whole thing. So you see like booting the runtime system of Haskell is the kind of time consuming activity, but running the actual function, doing the actual logic is not that bad. It, it takes 27 microseconds, right? Obviously, loading the C runtime system or Rust runtime system, which is very thin uh, or almost non-existing, will be shorter. So when you're executing the program in a bash, like when you're actually timing how long something takes here, here the time is like a wall clock. It's a time which includes everything. But here we have exactly isolated the time it takes to run our function, right? And the time to run our function is this 27.3 microseconds. And it kind of tails off to the slowest, um, I mean, to the shortest in terms of time and to the longest. And we see the distribution uh, and it should follow kind of a normal distribution, right? So it's a perfect um, summary of what has happened. And it gives us kind of an insight of how long our function runs. So let's do, um, let's quickly do a re-implementation. Questions, sounds like, okay. Exactly. So uh, if I use the larger file, it would be very long to, to demonstrate. All right. So we, as we said, WCP is fine, takes 27 microseconds, but we've learned that we should not use string. We should use text. So if we were to use text, um, let's quickly do that. So import... Um, qualified data text and st and then i will say i will say t text so i am giving text and then there are it is relatively straightforward uh what you really need to do is you need to go to package. So if you go to hackage Haskell and search for uh, data text and then yeah, maybe in Hugo data 
data text. Yeah, it's a text module. So if you go to this module, you will have all the functions which are available. Uh, and you will see there is a head function and so on and so forth. There is a length function which takes the text and gives you the size of the text, right? So you can already see here that for calculating the size of the text, I just have to use the one from the T, from the T module instead of the one from the pre prelude. Um, and it turns out like if you if you do a naive replacement, it turns out all those functions are implemented for text as well. So it actually is pretty straightforward. If you didn't know words and um, you can search here words, um, so breaking into breaking into words and lines, you go there and there is a words and lines, right? So those functions are available there and lines breaks the text into lines and gives you line, you know, an array, a list of lines and the same for words. So they are equivalent, but they use text instead of string. So we haven't done, uh, you know, the re-implementation took us uh, basically the same amount of time. We just need to know that there is a concept of text and all right, so let's let let me let me copy that and let me go back to the original because we want to have both. We want to have both versions. So we will call it WCP2. And this implementation is now using text. And then if we go like we save that, we will export it. WCP2, excellent. And then we will go here and now we have WC, which is using the, uh, the original one and read file returns a string, right? So read file takes the input uh, stream, reads the whole file and gives me a string. And I need one which will give me, so I want WC2, which will be also IO action. And then WC2 will be do, and it's pretty much the same. Um, I will be lazy again and do copy and paste. And then we will call WCP2, but WCP2 takes a text, not a string. So we need to replace this with something that reads, um, uh, that gives us a text, right? So we need to find a, a, a function. So if we go to Google, so we need a function which takes uh, a file path and gives us a text, right? Um, Right, let's see if there is a function like this. There isn't, but what about a function which takes a string and gives us a text? Yeah, there are some file, there are some functions like that. But no, 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 that, I, I did it wrong. Let's do it again. So file path, and it will not return as a text, it will return as an IO text. That's right, right? We need read file. So a read file will take a file and returns us an IO text and it lives in the de data text IO. If you replace it with string, you will get to the original uh, read file, which takes a file path and gives you an IO string. And we need the one which gives us the text. Excellent. So we need to use read file, but the read file is from the data text IO. So great. So what we will do is we will say we use import qualified data text IO as text IO. And then in here, we will say text IO read file. And this one gives us the IO text. This arrow unwraps the text from the IO context, and we have a text, pure text. We pass it to here, and then we have the results. That looks good. Uh, so let's go back to our 
tutorial um, because what we need to do, uh, we need to uh, write a benchmark suit. So a benchmark suit starts with the background group and then it follows with the benchmark and then yeah we, we basically need to do two things so we want to use a benchmark benchmark group um so let's go back here and say yeah let me see so it's a default main default main and then benchmark is embedded in the ben benchmark group so we need one more embedding. So we say bench, no, B group, B group. And then we name it. So we call it um, word count. And then this one has an array or a list. And then you do have those benchmarks done inside that and each benchmark is named. So then we will have this benchmark followed with, and we will call this one WC string. And then we will have this one and we'll call it WC2 text. Right. And we say WC2 and we need to close one more bracket. So let's try it out. If we didn't forgot anything. So stack build. Okay, so what you don't like? Uh... Okay, let's see. In here, we are... Uh... Right, 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 right. I think maybe data text. I don't think, do I need the T for the top level? Yes, I do, because it's not visible outside. Right, let's see one more time. I didn't save. All right. What you don't like? So couldn't match the expected theta with the list for which Number of words, T length, T words, text. So it looks like this one is some um, for some reason. To main. Yeah, this one looks fine. This is not complaining about the main, it's complaining about the lip. Line 21. Ah, yes, of course. So um, when we using the length from this module, uh, remember it takes a text and gives you the length of the text, but this guy, gives us a normal list. It's a plain list of text. So we're not supposed to use the other length. We're supposed to use the prelude length because it's a vanilla vanilla list, which is the result of that, of words and lines. It's just a vanilla list of text tokens, right? So that was our problem. All right, so let's build it. Right, so now it complains about the closing bracket. It doesn't like the... So we need to have one closing bracket here and one in that. 
Hope that should work. No, why not? Because this one should be here and this one should be here. Come on. Okay, so let's close this bracket here. And this bracket, yeah, should be fine. B group, uh, what was it called? B group with small g. B group with small g. All right, some minor problems. Okay, it builds. So now if we rerun it and print our statistics, it will run the WC and it will run the WC2 and then calculate all the, all the things for us and gives us the results. So if I open bench now, we have two results. And voila, look at that, we are faster. So WC, uh, remember that our, um, that our input file is now longer <laughs> because we've added that uh, some text. So WC now takes, remember before it was taking 27 microseconds, now it takes 38 microseconds because the input file is longer. But it is slower than our new implementation using text because our new implementation using text is 22.7 and this one is 38. So we have, you know, 33% improvement. We substantially cut down the processing time by doing a very trivial change from string to text, right? Um, oh yeah, Asol already found the, thanks Asol, I didn't see your comment. Um, also, I didn't see it. Cool, so uh, we see that we have um, an improvement and it is quite substantial. Is it good enough? Um, yeah, I think that is pretty good. You might be tempted. Um, you might be tempted to re-implement because if you look at it, if you look at this code, both both of those uh, implementations, and if you've done it in Rust this way, what you would be doing is you would be parsing or like going through the text three times, once for calculating the cars, once for calculating the words, and once for calculating the lines. And if you have three loops or three things going over your um, list, which is the list of characters, three times you would be tempted to say, well, maybe I should go through the whole thing once and calculate as I go once, when I have a word, when I have a character, and when I have um, the end of line, such that I will do this calculation in a single pass, right? So it, same in C, like if you were to implement it in C, you don't want to have three loops going over all the characters and the first one counting all the characters, the second one counting all the end of line characters for lines, and the last one counting when you have space and when you have words, to calculate the words because going over you know a million um long file will take three times longer than just going a single pass right so in many languages this implementation you would say yeah that implementation smells because i'm going through my input three times i should re-implement it and i did that Yesterday, I I, uh, I knew it, it's not gonna work, but I kind of re-implemented it um, with the third implementation, that Word WC three, uh, where I went through a single pass. And how you can do it? How can you do a single pass in Haskell? You can either do it through recursion. So you say take a head, check what it is, do the the counting and do the rest on the tail, right? Or you can use a fold. 
Um, which usually, which one you think usually is faster? Doing a recursive implementation, which, you know, I have some input, I take the head, do something with it, go uh, to a tail and kind of recursively call myself? Or should I have the processing done in a fold and kind of do it in a fold? Yes, so I, I, I agree with Cecilia that usually fold is faster. Why? So let's 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 I, I will show you. I, I'm not gonna re-implement it, but I will show you kind of a pseudo pseudo code, right? So if we were to do a, a word uh, word C3, and let's imagine that it's uh, that I'm getting a, a list of characters and I'm producing this triplet, right? So I'm producing the the trip the triplet results. I'm I'm not doing a proper implementation. So what I need to do is I have to say, uh, I need kind of a, a, a work function, right? So WC3 will take my list, which is the list of characters, and it will return um, it will return a triplet. So triplet, triplet, um, and where triplet. triplet is, uh, and here I'm, I'm doing this kind of a recursive call, right? Because I need kind of a work function to do the, the recursive call. So I, let's call it W3 recursive. And then I'm gonna pass to it the list. And then I'm gonna pass to it the current state, right? So currently we have zero, 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 and we're not counting the, the words. So like, um, you need to have a state to know if the, because like, look, look at this. If I have text like this, I have space, 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 no words. That's it. Then the word count is zero, but I have three characters and I have three white spaces, right? Now I have a character. So at this point, I should start counting words and say, yep, I have one word and then I have characters. And then I'm, I'm saying, yeah, I'm not counting words anymore because those characters belong to the same word, which I'm already counted. I already counted when I hit A. And then I have a space and that the space resets the counting of words. It says, okay, now if you get a new character, you should count it as a word, right? So I have kind of an additional st uh, state to, um, to, to use for checking if I am uh, counting word or not. All right, so then if I'm calling this recursively on this, then I will have something like this. I will have WC3R, and then I will have a case for empty list, right? And then I will, so so let's say I have a list and then I'm, I'm doing the implementation. So I will have some guards. And I'm when I'm doing it for the recursive version, I have to have a guard which says, if null list, then do something, right? Then, uh, because I have this uh, triplet here, so then return the triplet. Um, so this case, I will not have if I'm using fold, because fold knows when the list starts and when the list ends, and it will kind of do that for me, like the iterator will kind of do this from the beginning to the end. And my function, which is processing the, the elements, not, will not have to check every single time that I gave it an empty list. Whereas with this recursive call, I will have to check every single call to the to this function if the list is empty, right? Because if the list is empty, then I have to do this case. Otherwise, I'm doing something with the head. So here I will do head list and do something, and then you know call uh, do three. Uh, do C three R on tail of my list, right? So here I'm kind of returning the triplet with some calculations, and I am doing this recursive call on the on the tail uh, with the current results and current state. Um, but I like when I'm doing a fold, this condition is gone. I don't need this condition. So by just this, we already know. Uh, recursive calls will be uh, marginally slower 
than doing a fold. So fold is a pre preferable solution, right? So I did implemented it uh, using recursive call, and I and then re-implemented re it using a fold. And fold itself was about twenty percent faster than the recursive version. And I reused the same. I reused my uh, the same function. I just removed this condition because for for the fold I don't need it, right? So I will show you how my implementation looks like. So let's uh, close this. Let's go one step back, Haskell, word, no, word count, Haskell. Yeah, so that's the, that's the implementation I've done earlier and you will see the fault version so this is the implementation with the fold okay as you probably know fold has two options fold has um a lazy one without the tick and it has um a strict version with a tick so if you um if you're using fault and you know you have to process the entire thing especially if you're doing some uh, benchmarking you do want the version with the which is strict and the strict version will kind of evaluate things as it needs needs it such that you don't lose some performance by keeping track of where i am at the moment and then folding it back so it will kind of do things a little bit more imperatively in such a way that it will not keep kind of a postponing things until it has to evaluate them. It will evaluate them when the first time it, uh, the call is made. The call is made. Okay, so what, what are the usual things here? So um, as I said, we have to keep track of those three things, plus whether we counting words or not. Um, and we have some uh, some guards. And as you see, I, 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 I don't have this guard for an empty list because I'm kind of processing characters here. So if I have the end of line, I'm adding lines. If I get a space, I'm adding characters, but not words, but I'm flipping the, the counting of words. Otherwise, I'm counting. if I'm counting words, I'm adding words. And in each case, I have to in, 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 increment the character count, right? So it is doing the same thing, but I'm doing it manually from uh, left to right using a fold and using this kind of a folding function, which will give me the triplet, the calculated triplet at the end. I will push the, the repo to the uh, repository such that you can spend a little bit more time uh, doing this and understanding what, what happens, but the logic is pretty simple. And we basically have the other two implementations the same way. So WC is based on the is based on the string. WC2 is based on the text, the, the same as we did before. And then this WC3 is based on the fold with a strict fold and then um, kind of a very simple counting function, which goes character by character and counts appropriate things, right? So can you optimize it even more? No, you. I don't think so. I don't think you can uh, optimize it more. I think this is the most you can squeeze out of that. And the, the reason why I'm using T-fold is because um, I don't have a normal list. I have a text and text is not, uh, yeah, let me show you here. So text is kind of similar to an, a, a list of car, but it's not, it's, it's actually not a, like a proper Haskell list of car. If it was a proper list of car, uh, I could use the normal fold, but because text is kind of something similar to this, but it's not the proper list, I have to use the T, right? I, I need a function which can understand the text data structure and it knows the text data structure is a foldable data structure, but it's not a normal list uh, with the square brackets. That's what we had with words. So if I use words on string, it gives me 
um, a list, a, a normal list of string of strings. And then if you do T words on text, it gives you a normal list of text, right? That's why length, you could use uh, length on, on this data structure and length on this data structure. But text, text itself is not a list. So a normal length will not, will not work on text. You have to use the T length, right? So I need to use T length for calculating the length of this. And I have to use T fold left for doing folds on the on this foldable. Okay, so that's about typing type system. And now we have those three implementations and we have WC on string, WC2 on text and WC3 on um on the on our fault. So let's run let's run it and let's compare those three. Yare yare yare. All right, so open, open bench. It's another thing, so uh, did I close it? All right, so here, here it is. So WC, that's the longest. Uh, WC2, that one is on based on text. And then WC3, this one was based on our fold. And surprise, surprise, our fold one is slower than the one which we did with supposedly three passes over a data structure, right? It's not super slower, but it is slower. And because our file is, is larger, you can see that the gap between the naive, naive um, string implementation is getting longer compared to the fastest one than before. Before we were like 33%, now we more than half faster, right? Um, why is that? Well, you know, th this one is inefficient. And as the data input grows, the inefficiency compounds and it's kind of slower and slower compared to the to the fast one right so if you did compare those two or those three on a larger data input uh, the performance gains would be larger and larger right so we have um wc you can see it's um it is almost normal but it has this kind of a little hump somewhere here, so seven, 78 microseconds. Uh, WC2, it's you know more than half of the previous one. So 78 and 32, uh, and then WC3 is 39. So we losing to the, with the fault, with this implementation, we losing to the, to this one, which is quite interesting, right? Uh, because you would think doing a single pass is faster than doing three passes. But the trick here is that Haskell is not doing three passes. Haskell is smart enough to work out that you need to do those three things over the same uh, data structure and it will do it in a efficient way such that it will do it over a single pass. So this implementation is already doing a single pass. It's not doing three passes over your data uh, because Haskell can work out what needs to be done. And uh, those three things, it knows they are done on the same data thing. Uh, so it needs to find a way to do it. 
In Haskell, of course, it doesn't matter if I reorder those lines. If I put this line before or after, like if I reorder all those lines, um, even though I have a do, but those three lines have let, right? So the lines which don't have let, like this line has to be executed first, and this line has to be executed after this line. Haskell knows that because I, I told it, look, we're doing some sequential computations here. I need you to, you know, to uh, follow my order. So this line will be executed first. This line will be executed last. But those three lines are with let. And what let tells Haskell is, okay, we have to have a symbol which is bound to something, but in which order those lets are done doesn't matter as long as they are done before this line needs to be done, right? So first of all, Haskell can do those three things concurrently, doesn't have to do them in the same thread. So that's already a, a big gain. Like if you were to implement it in Rust and you were to do it in a multi-threaded way, you would have to take care of it yourself. Haskell doesn't, uh, doesn't need you to tell it this. Haskell can do those things in parallel out of the onset. Uh, second thing is, Haskell can do all those three things in a different order. Uh, and also it can combine uh, processing some of the things which go over the same data structure uh, in memory kind of efficiently. So surprisingly, those three lines, even though we thought yeah, they are quite inefficient, we have to do three passes, um, only um, you know, uh, naively inefficient. They are actually very efficient. And it turns out this implementation is the fastest because in this implementation, when I'm doing the fold, Haskell cannot parallelize anything. Uh, Haskell cannot run multiple threads because I told Haskell exactly what to do. And I told it to go from the head to the tail, uh, like iterate once and do this logic, right? Uh, so then Haskell has very little room for optimizations. It's exactly doing what I told it to do. Uh, there is only one let, so there is no space for reordering. And th that's exactly what, what I told it to do. So you can see that the compiler and the runtime system optimizing those three lines is doing better job than me doing it by hand in W3C, uh, WC3, right? Because you can see that my by hand optimizations are losing to the compiler. Of course, I'm winning with the uh, with the original string, but I suspect if I re-implemented this using string, I would be actually worse than the original string implementation using the naive three lets in the string as well, because the compiler could have optimized that better than me. Um, so yeah, the bottom line here is you've learned a little bit about how to use benchmarking. Also, how misleading your mental model might be. You basically have to assume your mental model is wrong. You, you always have to measure and see what actually happens. And the last thing is that the compilers, especially for managed languages like Golang or, or Haskell, are pretty smart. And then outsmarting them takes quite an effort. So a lot of times, re-implementing something in Rust or C++ will turn out slower because you're not doing all the optimizations that the compiler already knows about and the compiler is doing them in the higher order languages. Uh, that's universally obviously not true. You can make C++ and Rust implementation super fast, but you have to be very determined and you have to be quite precise exactly what you want to achieve. Um, so that that's... Um, that's basically the summary for the for those um, exercises that we've done today. Let me check the comments. Um, so Oyston, that's right. So uh, Osulf also say that uh, folds are faster because um, recursion has the cost associated with the function calls. That is true, although most compilers in most languages will uh, unwrap the function calls into a loop 
uh, and the loop will not have, uh, it, it will kind of inline the, the logic of the function in kind of the a longer loop logic. So there will be a loop, but you will not be paying per, uh, performance penalty for making the function calls mo most of the time. Sometimes they cannot do it. So especially for tail recursive functions, uh, it will unroll it into a loop and then you will not have this penalty. For other recursions, which are not tail recursive, it cannot do it and then you will pay this penalty. So that's correct. Um, so I, I was just commenting on on this. Let me put the comments here because I, I don't think you will see the comments. So this one was comment from Osulf. Yeah, that's correct. So then there is a comment um, from Oysten. So this one, what should we consider when balancing performance versus simplicity and readability? That's right. So that is um, that is a problem. Uh, that's a very good point. And let, let me read. Um, let me read uh, Cecilia's comment also. So, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. so this one is missing end of lines and then, yeah, that's the previous one. What I want is this one, copy. Okay, so your question makes me think about what Per Morton talked about. What I got from his lecture was that we should think performance from the start and take steps to improve performance, but without messing too much with how the line from here. No, so here we disagree with Per Morton. I, I disagree with Per Morton. <laughs> uh, so the thing is, um, I think he's right, but I also think he's wrong. So the there is no black and white answer. That, that is the answer. Uh, the answer is gray. And the balancing act is kind of hard. So when you look at the code, um, when you look at the code between WC and WC2, what is the loss of readability? What is the loss of, um, uh, of maintenance? There is none, right? There is no reason to do this implementation. There is no reason at all to do this implementation based on a string. No reason whatsoever. So you should not do it. You should only do this one, right? Um, this one is as simple as this one, but it also is the most performant one. So in our simple demo, it turns out uh, doing uh, the simplest implementation with the right data structure is the right choice because it is the, the most the well performant one and it's the easy to maintain. Uh, how about this one? I tried really hard to squeeze out the most performance and then it I shoot myself in the foot. This one is really hard to maintain. This one is really error prone. I might have made mistakes here. And probably if you were really careful, I will rerun it again. Um, look. I'm running the benchmarks again on our uh, lib file. And look, it says 43 words, 200, um, 43 lines, 213 words for the first two. And then for the last one, it says 42 and 212. I'm missing one word and one line somewhere. Somewhere there is a bug which miscounts uh, one word and one, one, um, so it's in that implementation. So if I do again, look, we should have 42. So this one is correct. This implementation is correct, but the number of words is missing one word, right? Uh, compared to the baseline, to the, to the, you know, ground truth. So I already have a bug. I have a small bug in this implementation, right? Yeah, it is error prone. It is complex. I should not be doing this. I should not be trying to outsmart the compiler. I should do this, okay? And then only when, when the compiler is doing the optimizations and it is still not good enough, then you start messing around. 
then you say, okay, I need to do something clever here. I need this to be faster and I need to do something to make this faster, but you've already implemented it and you've implemented it. And then you have, you have it in the charts. You know how long it takes because if you only did this and you didn't do, uh, if you only did WC3 and you didn't do WC2, you would not know if your performance optimizations are worth it, right? If I only did this and this, if I only did WC and WC3 and I said, yes, I'm the, I'm the winner, I'm the hacker, I kind of uh, optimized away all this nonsense from here, I would be wrong because in fact, the compiler was still smarter than me if I used the naive implementation. So the suggestion from Permorten that you should always optimize and always think about performance is correct. You should think about the performance, but you should not be hacking around too early. You should be doing readable, reasonable implementations. And then if you really need to squeeze more performance out of it, you should be hacking it. But then you already have a baseline and you know if your hacks are kind of doing anything positive. My didn't, so it was po pointless. Maybe you can, right? Maybe you can take this code and you can come up with a way of outsmarting the compiler and making the word count faster. And I challenge you, you can try that, right? You can try to make word count faster than this implementation. And then you can easily see if you win by comparing it to this implementation because you have the framework to, to do this checking. Um, so you should be tinkering with the optimizations and performance only in the context of benchmarking. When you're writing code, you should be making reasonable decisions. Uh, using uh, words and lines was a reasonable decision. Using string was not. Uh, you should be using text, right? Um, that's that's the kind of the moral of the story. Uh, yeah, I, I think I, I, I well, you know, I don't think I disagree with Permorten. I think we are on the same page. We had a long discussions uh, a lot of times, and I think we are on the same page. And he and his job, his task is to make things as fast as possible. Uh, performance is the um, the key um, requirement and he needs to think about it. So he needs to think what to do from the onset to make things kind of efficient, uh, to think about efficient data structures and efficient algorithms. Uh, we should be doing the same, but we should not be sacrificing the performance, um, the readability and maintenance from the beginning. We should be doing things like this and then having the benchmark saying, okay, what else can we squeeze out? How can we reorganize it such that we can squeeze things out? And I don't think um, this code is the good way to go. Um, maybe, I don't know, like I, I, I don't really, I cannot think, it's like, it's, it's a too simple problem here. I don't think I can beat the, um, I can beat the Rust compiler in this particular problem because it's just too simple and the compiler already squeezes the most of it. Uh, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there is some clever way of, of um, dealing with this, but definitely not using a fault, right? Because this, this clearly is slightly slower. All right. Yeah. So um, Cecilia says that we should start with the simplest simplest solution first and then try to rework it. Um, so that's, th that's the rule of thumb. It is hard. It is hard also to see what data structure should be using and what will result in the better reliability, uh, readability or a better um, performance because it takes with experience. And if you don't have this experience or you know, um, baggage of uh, playing, you will not know. So you just need to gain this experience. And while you're gaining this experience, you will make wrong decisions. You will make wrong choices. Um, so that's fine. You can always redo it. Um, okay, so we have uh, five minutes left. So I want to talk a little bit about the, um, about the assignment too, because in assignment two, the performance is not an issue. Um, so there is one more. Since text is faster, is there any reason why we ever should use string? 
That's a very good question. This question has been asked on a Haskell mailing list a lot of times. And people were saying, why we even have, you know, string in Haskell if you can uh, make everything using text and you can make text to be the default. Like if I, if I do this, if I say, you know, this is text, why this is string instead of this being automatically a text. Um, if you use uh, overloaded strings, if you use a uh, language overloaded strings, this will be a text when you need a text in the function, right? Uh, so you can kind of force it, but you have to do this. You have to do use this extension and you have to kind of uh, manually manage that. Um, the answer is that for historical reasons, uh, somehow there is a certain appeal for a string, as I explained, to be an actual Haskell list over characters. Uh, there is a certain, um, th those two things are the same, right? So string is an ordinary list over characters. And that has a certain educational, let's say, or historical appeal. Um, and that's why we have string in the, um, because it is a proper normal, it is a normal, a normal list, whereas text is not a list, right? It's not a Haskell list. Um, and that's the only reason, uh, which I think is very weak. I also agree that text should be the default string in Haskell. Like actually there should be no string, it should be just text. Uh, and then if you want a normal list of characters, you should have there is a function on text. It's called unpack. Um, so if you if you have a text, if T is a text, and if you say unpack, unpack I uh, from the module text. If you say unpack T, it will give you uh, it gives gives a normal list of car. So it actually returns this, right? And then you can you could use it as if like as you as we are currently using string, um, so I guess it's a little bit of a community dilemma. Like some people are somehow attached to the string for historical reasons, uh, and then it kind of lingers. I think at some point it will change, but Haskell community is quite conservative, and it takes a while. You see those decisions sometimes being a little bit illogical especially in Rust, like you see them a lot in Rust. Um, but here, yes, I agree, it should be a text. Okay, so we have two minutes to talk about the assignment too. <laughs> uh, so maybe I will do it uh, in an additional session. Maybe I will record a short video for Thursday. Unfortunately, on Thursday, there will be no lab. I have, um, I have to be somewhere. Um, so two minutes, very quick, okay. So pseudocode, um, I want to stress, so assignment, assignment two, um, pseudocode, everybody knows what it is, but I, I bet none of you tried it out. Like none of you tried it out. What would you like to have for your implementation? Okay. And I think that's a kind of a mistake for very complex problems. It, it is very useful to conceptualize in your head and under your fingers, what would you like to have as a result of your design, right? So we know we have a problem. We, we're, writing, um, we're writing an implementation for our uh, operations. And then we need to have a little bit of a mental mechanism of what we would like to achieve. So for example, if you want to uh, implement a behavior for a plus operator, right? So plus, a token plus will be represented as some sort of a operation in your type system. Let's call it uh, operation add. And then you will have some evaluate, um, evaluate function conceptually. Uh, and then evaluate will be evaluating different things. In our case, it will be evaluating kind of uh, operations and you want at the end, you want to have kind of a, a result. And the result can be an error 
or it can be kind of a correct behavior, right? So we already he here know that we can kind of result in an error or correct behavior. And what is the correct behavior? Our operations kind of take data from stack and put data back into the stack. So the plus will be kind of a manipulation of the of the program state or program stack, right? So we can call it program state. So we have either an operation. Um, when evaluating an operation, we can either an error or a program state. So if I'm evaluating an operation for add, what would I like to like? How would I like to this to to be? Well, I would like it to be like this. I would like to say, um, get me a first um, left hand side. Um, it's actually right hand side, right? Get me the first item from the stack, and that's the right most one. So that would be the Y, okay? So I would like to be something like this. I would like to say, okay, uh, Y is pop uh, from the stack, right? I'm popping a value from the stack and that's Y. And then X is pop from the stack. And then I would like to say Z is X plus Y because I have the X and Y. And then I would like to push Z to the stack. That's what I would like my implementation for evaluation of the plus to be like. Four lines of code, uh, getting the two arguments for my plus, doing the actual plus with the Haskell or Rust plus, and then pushing the results back, right? Uh, this pseudocode um, is basically my conceptualization, how I would like my implementation to work, okay? And I need to organize my data structures and I want to organize my facilities in my implementation such that I will get this, right? Um, the pseudocode is really helpful because it kind of navigates your dream, navigates your implementation solution, right? So then I can, um, if I go to, uh, let me quickly go. Okay, so is this clear? I think this is clear. So I will show you my evaluate, um, I will show my implementation in Haskell for evaluate the plus operator, like how my interpreter is actually implemented. Um, and my interpreter is implemented like this. I'm getting Y. I have a utility function called pop, which gives me the current top element from my operand stack. Gives me Y again from pop. And then I have to have uh, integers, right? If those two are not integers, I have to do something else. But if those two operands are integers, then I'm basically doing the plus and I'm doing the push, right? So I'm doing this. Okay, if those two things are not integers, well, I may have an error or I may coerce the values to integers or to floats and do the, po the, the plus. I, I'm deciding here, right? So I decided that if those values, if the if those two values can be, they are not uh, v, v ints. They are some other type. They can be a string. They can be floats. They can be boolean. They can be whatever. But if they can be coerced to a float, I will coerce them to a float, both of them, and then I will do plus on them, and then I will push that value to the stack, or if I cannot do this, if I cannot coerce them to floats and calculate the sum, then I will have an error, right? So my implementation for dealing with add is very similar to my dream of the pseudocode that I originally planned to have. It's almost the same initially, but then I have to deal with some edge cases. I have to deal with the edge case of, the, of them not being ints or them being something else and then not being able to do this plus, right? And some error handling. What happens if I cannot pop 
something from the stack. If I have already empty stack and I'm trying to pop, this line will throw an error. It will say, we expect a value on the stack for the plus, right? So I'm already using an applicative because I'm doing it in the context of this monad uh, with the do operation. And this is pretty neat. This implementation in Haskell is very neat. And all you need for this type of implementation is a state monad. Uh, state monad allows you to keep track of a state. Um, and then um, I, you know, what is the signature of my evaluate? Um, well, the signature is evaluate takes a value. And the value can be either a primitive value like ints and floats, or it can be an operation. And it returns a program state. And program state is my kind of a complex data structure using a state monad, which encapsulates the stack and all the other things internally. Uh, and that, that's all. Uh, and pop, pop um, has a signature, which is a program state. Right, it's um, it actually doesn't do anything. It uh, asks like you you pass it in the context of program state, and it kind of extracts uh, a value uh, out of the program state, and then you can use this um, arrow to kind of uh, sneak in a particular value. Yeah, actually, it does it does this. Yeah, so then you can sneak out. Um, the no, yeah, let me not lie to you. I I think it's like this because I can get the I can get the value out of the program state uh just um just doing this. All right, we ran out of time. It's seven past, so I will finish here. Um what I wanted to stress is that if you do use pseudocode, then it will help you uh, to conceptualize what the final effect you want to have. And writing pseudocode is cheap. Uh, it's just like, uh, and you can kind of, you know, very easily conceptualize what you want to achieve. Uh, writing code is much harder and much more time consuming. And once you wrote this, you have kind of a mental commitment to kind of stick to it, whereas with pseudocode, you don't. So what I encourage you to do is to write pseudocode of what would you like to have uh, such that your implementation is nice and easy to, to manage and nice and easy to work with. All right, so that's all. I will stop recording here. Um,